Okay, uh, continue. Uh, so welcome, bienvenue and miigwech. Uh, thank you to our first uh, meeting after the summer of the Historical Society of Ottawa. Uh, as uh, you can tell, uh, we've got lots of presentations coming up for 2020 and 2021, but I do want to introduce our guest speaker tonight. You can say our guest speaker tonight is certainly an accomplished speaker. From 1973 to 1980, 1980 Jim Hercombe was a familiar voice on CKCU-FM Radio Carlton. From 1980 to 2000, Jim hosted a number of programs on CHEZ 106, including the morning show and the afternoon variety show in the city. From 2000 to 2008, Jim worked for CFRA Radio. It kept moving around, Jim. Were you getting fired or were you <laughs> you're just moving on? <laughs> no comment. And now Jim is the host of The Sound of the Underground, live 88.5, Sunday nights at 9 p.m. Jim is also a musician, teacher, music trivia host. That's going to come in handy tonight. Mm -hmm. And most importantly for us tonight, he has recently written his first book, Rockin' on the Rideau. And he's with us tonight to talk about his book and the history of rock and roll in Ottawa. So, Jim, take it away. And I also work uh, full time at uh, Aboriginal Affairs for the government. So it's nice to see this, uh, uh, it, you know, the, the, the uh, unceded territory of the Algonquin people. It's nice to see that uh, recognition made. So it's uh, good cool. work. Uh, thank you for inviting me. First of all, when I got the uh, uh, the call from Ben about uh, doing this as part of the Historical Society Speaker Series. I was a bit surprised and a bit frightened, but of course I said yes right away. Uh, it's a good opportunity to share these great stories with, with you guys. And uh, uh, I mean, it's not about selling books because I didn't get into this to sell a book. I looked at it as more of a, a, a calling perhaps. And it was important to me to get these stories out now because in 10 years, they'll be forgotten. They'll be, you know, disappear into the mists of time. We're covering a time period in volume number one uh, called Ottawa's Golden Age of Rock and Roll from 19... 55 to 1970. Volume two, which is just about finished, covers 1970 to 1980. And then I am burying the pen and leaving the rest of the story to others who perhaps were more involved in the music scene in the 80s and 90s. Uh, but I was just fascinated about how, what an exciting era this was for not only music, but for Ottawa culture. And I think that's where it ties into the uh, Ottawa Historical Society because it, a city's culture is as important as buildings and canals and, and bridges. And in nineteen early 1950s, of course, Ottawa had a reputation as being a kind of dull, gray government town with not much going on, which is to a large extent was true. But uh, come the 1960s, it just exploded into technicolor, as did most of the rest of the world. And that's what the book is all about. And it's based 90% on interviews with people who were there, the disc jockeys, the promoters, uh, the sound people, the, the magazine and newspaper writers, the fans, and first and foremost, the bands. If it weren't for the people from bands I interviewed, it might have been a very short book because, uh, you know, as I mentioned, a lot of these groups are lost in obscurity. I hope we, hopefully we've resurrected some. But all the people I interviewed left me with at least one good contact, you know. Oh, you got to talk to so-and-so. You have to talk to so-and-so. And that led to so many more interviews than I expected. And uh, I think the content of the book is great. It's, it's embellished by some fantastic pictures, mostly from the bands themselves, uh, publicity posters, uh, photos from the archives, the Ottawa archives as well. They were very helpful. So it all came together really nicely. And uh, I hope you enjoy our presentation and walk through an amazing golden decade of rock and roll. And if you have any questions, do you know, send them in. And, and I think Richard is compiling those for later on. Yes, I'm glad you. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. Uh, yeah, if you've got questions, please type them into chat. Our story basically starts in the late 1950s, when the auto rock and roll scene was, let's just say, it wasn't very edgy. It was very middle of the road, and the bands that were around were mostly vocal bands, kind of like the Crew Cuts and the uh, the Four Aces and bands like that who would do mostly vocals. Uh, rock and roll was not really born until 1955. We'll get to that story in a second. But first of all, when we talk about the 1960s, it was a decade of turbulence. We had, of course, the assassination of JFK in 1963. We had ongoing uh, uh, conflict around the world, including the war in Vietnam, really, really ramping up. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, came the moonwalk, 1969. 
technology was also taking off in the 60s. But it was all hinged oh, no. around an event in 1964 that most of you probably remember. You were probably watching television that night in uh, February of 1964. As Ed Sullivan got up on stage and went, now, ladies and gentlemen, would you welcome, please, the Beatles. And there they were. And the world turned from black and white to technicolor, even though the show itself was in black and white. The Beatles had that impact on culture around the world. And Ottawa, of course, was, uh, was no different at all. We go back, though, let's start by talking a bit about the evolution of popular music in North America. This is part of a course that I taught at Algonquin College. And just as kind of abbreviated as much as possible, we started with the blues, which was brought over to uh, North America, not or involuntarily by the slaves, of course, from Africa who were brought over to uh, supplement the, the cotton fields down south. And they brought with them not much, no luggage, no suitcases, but they did bring along their culture. And part of that culture was this little thing we see here. It was like a box with one string and a neck on it. It was a forerunner to the banjo, to the guitar in North America. It was called the diddly bow. And uh, the natives would use this to, to play their music, which was a very rudimentary style, uh, mostly sung in the cotton fields. It was a, a call and response style where the leader would say, you know, I've been working all day and my back is starting to hurt. I've been working all day and my back is starting to hurt. And then everyone else would pick up on it. And you had the, what was called later on the blues structure. And again, this evolved very quickly, but the diddly bow was a primary instrument that they used. And if that name sounds familiar, there was an artist in the 50s named Bo Diddley. He just took the name diddly bow, turned it around and came up with his, his stage name. Uh, in the hills of Appalachia, we had uh, cultures of all different uh, origins, uh, Germans, French, uh, some Irish, Scots, and they were going to try to be amongst themselves. So they had these enclaves, these little communities spread through places like the Appalachian Mountains. And they brought their own instruments and their own styles of music. And generally, as these communities got made contact with each other, the instruments and the musical styles would also kind of move from town to town. And you have on this picture a violin, you've got some guitars, and you've got a washboard. And this is where American folk music, which would turn into country and Western music, began, where the songs are mostly about their experiences, what's in the news, what's, what's happening in their lives. And uh, again, that's where folk music came from. It was a form of storytelling using musical instruments. Out West, we also had storytelling around the apocryphal uh, uh, campfire with the pot of beans, if you've, if you've seen Blazing Saddles, you know what I mean. And they had their guitars mostly uh, from the Spanish American culture. And from out West, we had a style that would become Western music. And over the years, all this music could kind of move closer together. So we had blues influencing folk music, Western music influencing country music. And so by the late 1940s, you had very distinctive musical styles in the United States. You had uh, jazz music starting down the Southern United States. Uh, after the Civil War, there was an incredible amount of marching band instruments that were kind of thrown out or thrown into stores and sold. And young musicians would buy these and they would, do, in their blues band, they would start using trumpets and trombones and drums and bass drums. And that's basically where the blues came from was this blues music linking up with what came out of the American Civil War as far as musical instruments went. Well, here we are now in Ottawa. So how did all this impact us up here? Of course, there was no radio, there was no television, there was no internet to, to, you know, to spread musical styles. But here we had the same thing we had in the States. We had different cultures coming together. And in this area, a lot of that was spurred, of course, by the building of the Rideau Canal. You had the Irish, you had the Scottish. Of course, you had the French who were here already. And again, they would get together, they would sing their songs, they would hear other songs, and this music would all come together to form a music that was kind of unique to the Ottawa Valley, plus an accent that was uniquely, you know, the how's the, how's the day there, boy, kind of accent that still exists in, in some places in the valley. Uh, but all this came together, the music was primarily, again, folk music, which morphed into a kind of country style with the acoustic guitars. Ottawa had a very rich uh, heritage of country music going back to the, the 1930s, the 40s and 50s. Few people realize that CFRA radio, which is now known 
for stock programming and got into rock and roll in the 50s and 60s, it started as primarily a country music station. You would have Ottawa Valley country bands, for example, uh, like you had the Happy Wanderers who hosted their own daily radio show on CFRA at noon. And they had their own television show on CJOH in the 1960s. And you also had another band that was quite popular called the Melodiers. Very professional. You see a washboard, guitars, a mandolin, and piano. And they were superstars here in the Ottawa Valley. Uh, to show how big country music was, I'll go back a couple of slides. You might recognize this gentleman. The one, the only Hank Williams, uh, the king, the god of country music, who came to Ottawa in 1952. And here he is with a, a fan in the Ottawa Valley. So again, country music reigned in this area. Here in Ottawa, it was mostly, uh, you know, the music of the 1950s and the late 1940s, a lot of big band, jazz, and the popular hits of the day. And the couples would go out on a Friday, Saturday night and do some dancing at the Midtown Ballroom or at Lakeside Gardens, perhaps and enjoy that kind of music. And any local bands would play this. They wouldn't be dabbling as much into country or certainly not blues or jazz, but they would play big band and swing and some of the more middle of the road music from the era. Now, just moving along here to Big Joe Williams was a, a big influence in bringing blues music and country music together in the Southern United States. And from Joe Williams and other artists like him, uh, we got what was basically a hybrid of rock and roll music. And the early rock and roll music was played extensively on the radio stations uh, down south, thanks to some very brave uh, white disc jockeys on southern radio stations. And it was hearing artists like Big Joe Turner and others that we got people like this fellow, Elvis Aaron Presley from Memphis, Tennessee. And he, on the, he would listen to this music on the radio, music by Big Mama Thornton, by uh, Big Joe Turner and others. And he would also hear straight country music. So here we had that hybrid of country and Western and, and blues coming together in the Southern states. Other uh, early rockers like Jerry Lee Lewis, Little Richard, even Johnny Cash, who started as a rock and roll star. They listened to these Southern bands and they would sing the songs in their rooms and they would kind of adapt them to a, a much whiter style. Of course, we know the story of Elvis Presley going into Sun Studios in Memphis, recording a song. It becomes an overnight sensation. And Elvis Presley, within a few days, was well known in Memphis. And over the next year or so, this was 1955, and 1956 started touring across America, being played on the radio and became a superstar. Now, this is the Ottawa Capitol Theater, a uh, theater I remember well from Elgin Street days and some great concerts that happened there. And uh, the, sorry, the Capitol Theater was on Bank Street. And here he is, Elvis Presley in his first movie, Love Me Tender. And it was in this whirlwind of Elvis mania that the king came to Ottawa. And that still shocks a lot of people to think that Elvis Presley actually came to Ottawa. Well, he did in 1957 for two shows at the Ottawa Auditorium. And thanks to the Ottawa archives, this is a picture of the crowd here in Ottawa. It's, it's fun to look at those faces. You've got uh, mostly women, uh, a lot of women who might be in their 30s or 40s, some younger, and a lot of guys who are there mostly because their date wanted to go, or else they were musicians themselves and they were curious about this new style of music called rock and roll. This was really the first big bang here in Ottawa when it came to rock and roll music. Elvis Presley, two shows at the auditorium, he played only three concerts, three outdoor, or out, three concerts outside of the United States over the entire course of his career. Three cities, Vancouver, Toronto, and Ottawa. Uh, it's kind of shady as to why he never went anywhere else outside the United States, but uh, most of the figures point at his manager, Colonel Tom Parker, who was probably an illegal immigrant to the United States from Holland. He was also an army deserter. And he feared if he went out of town, out of the country, he would never get back in. And he wouldn't go anywhere without Elvis, but he did make it to Canada. Somehow he got in and got out at the same time. Uh, but that show, there was supposed to be one in Montreal. It was canceled. It was uh, basically canceled by the Roman Catholic Church who did not want the son of Satan in their city. And sure enough, the, the show was canceled. So Ottawa was next in line. And there's a great story uh, in the book from uh, that shows how paranoid the church was about Elvis Presley even coming to Ottawa. 
uh, all the kids at Roman Catholic schools, all the girls were forced to sign basically a, a, a contract saying they would not go to the show. It reads like this. It says, quote, I promise I shall not take part in the reception accorded Elvis Presley, and I shall not be present at the program presented by him at the auditorium on Wednesday, April 3rd. They were all forced to sign this and to hand them into the teacher. And if they went to the show and it was found out, they would be expelled. And sure enough, nine girls at Notre Dame Convent School were expelled. There are other stories about girls sneaking out of their bedrooms late at night, you know, <laughs> down the east trough or whatever, and sneaking off to see Elvis perform at the auditorium. I think the top, top ticket price was $2.50. It was jammed, you could not hear a thing, but that was Elvis Presley. Another cool story about, uh, about Elvis here is that uh, he wore part of his famous gold lame outfit. Uh, in Toronto, he wore it all, but he was so sick of wearing it. This, this, uh, I think Colonel Tom said it was worth $10,000, but it cost him about $400 to make. It was all gold lame, the shoes and everything. And Elvis hated it because it was hot to play in. In Toronto, he played in the full suit. In Ottawa, he just wore the jacket. And at his next gig in Philadelphia, he just wore the shoes. He basically pared back the outfit. So we only got to see part of that famous gold MA jacket in Ottawa. Uh, but Elvis was apparently a very nice fellow, very down to earth. Uh, There's an interview with Gord Atkinson from CFRA Radio, who emceed the show in the book. And he said Elvis was the shy guy, he was very polite. But he felt sorry for him because between shows, he couldn't go out to get something to eat. All he had to eat was a, a ham and cheese sandwich from the vending machine. Because if he went out, he'd be swamped. And he was sort of seemed to have shocked him himself that this was going to be so big. But backstage after the show, he sat cross-legged, met with some fans and also with the media for some interviews. This was your typical Ottawa band before Elvis Presley came to town. Uh, they were called the uh, High Tones. And they were, uh, they played some instruments as well, but they're mainly a vocal band. But after that, uh, the drummer for the band, a guy named Butch Pro, was in the audience. And he told me, after that night, very few bands went back to playing what they were playing. They saw what was happening. They started adding rock and roll. Even the mainstream big bands here in Ottawa would add a rock and roll song or two to get people dancing because it was obviously the next big thing. Uh, and to show how big Elvis was, the, the young lady on the left here, uh, did an Elvis impersonation in 1956 at a talent show over on the Hull side, and she won. Uh, the woman in the middle looks gracious, like a gracious loser. The guy on the right was obviously a little PO'd that he didn't win because he thought he had more talent than any of them. Within a year, the boy on the right would be the biggest pop star in the world. That is Paul Anka from 1956 at a talent show in Quebec. He was a go-getter. He would borrow his quotes, borrow his mother's car to drive over to the clubs to do these talent shows. And he was very good. And within a year, he was down in New York City, again, on his own initiative. He was 15 at the time, uh, recorded a song called Diana about his babysitter and became the world's biggest pop star within, within a year. It's an amazing story, but here he looks rather glum that he, uh, that he lost. There's even a story in the book about uh, one musician remembering getting on a bus going downtown around 1955 and all of a sudden, this kid stands up in the back of the bus and starts to sing. Sure enough, it was Paul Anka. This is the scene of some amazing, amazing concerts. The auditorium, which is now the site of the uh, YMCA at Argyle and, uh, and uh, Metcalf and O'Connor. Uh, it was a site of many big shows. The Rolling Stones played there. Bob Dylan played there. Uh, Gene Autry, as you can see, the Cowboy star played there. And it was the Beach Boys were there as well. So it was a hub of concerts in this Ottawa area, as was the Coliseum down at Lansdowne Park. The auditorium was torn down in 1966, just in time for the Civic Center to open. First show at the Civic Center was The Who in 1967. So there were these big places to play. Jerry Lee Lewis was another early rock and roll star who played at the auditorium. And here's an example of one of the big traveling shows that would come to Ottawa. Look at these names, Bill Haley and the Comets, Chuck Berry. You had the Clovers, the Platters, uh, Paul Anka played at one of these, Buddy Holly played at one of these. So we had our shows coming through town, mostly thanks to the auditorium. Uh, the first rock and roll star here in Ottawa, well, you could say it was this fellow, Huey Scott. 
who was from the small town of Riceville outside Ottawa, who started as a country performer, then a rockabilly performer, which combined country and rock and roll, uh, played all the clubs, the clubs in town, was a, a prodigy, and was also Elvis, uh, Ottawa's best Elvis impersonator. He used to, uh, go to go to shows here dressed as Elvis, and the girls, he said, would chase him into the washroom. He was so popular. And he's still performing in this area, and he is a, a local legend. His name is Huey Scott, if you want to look him up. Uh, again, another band from the uh, late 1950s. It, the instrumental sound was big here in Ottawa. Uh, the fellow on the right, his name is Gary Cobo. He would go on to become a member, a founding member of the Esquires, who were Ottawa's first major rock band of the 1950s. We had the high tones. You know, they had a saxophone player, a piano player. And uh, again, they very much fit into the mold of the late 1950s band. And the Jive Rockets. Ooh, and a rockabilly band featuring two future stars. On the right, we have Vern Craig, again, a founding member, the founding member of the Staccatos later on. And this band was more rockabilly, rock and roll. And the Staccatos, he helped bring them with his writing abilities and performance. He was one of the greats of the auto rock and roll scene. And the drummer, a guy named Dewey Martin. Uh, if you know your 60s rock, I'll be impressed. If you know the Buffalo Springfield, who are one of the most important American rock and roll bands, of the 1960s. Neil Young was in that band, Steve Stills was in that band, and Dewey Martin was their drummer. So again, uh, not many people know he's from uh, this area, he's from Chesterville. And so uh, another big star from Ottawa was Gene Cornish, who played in uh, played solo for the most part here in Ottawa. He played bowling alleys, wherever he could get in. And a very good guitar player. He became a member of the Young Rascals, who were another huge, huge American band of the 1960s. Now, what happened to rock and roll? Well, in 1958, late 57, early 58, Elvis Presley went into the army, got his hair cut, came out with a tuxedo, singing with Frank Sinatra. So one of the main kingpins of rock and roll was gone in 1958. Jerry Lee Lewis, seen here with his granddaughter. No, wait a minute, that's his wife, who was 13 at the time, and his cousin, which was not unusual down the southern states but the rest of uh, North America and the world didn't take kindly to this. And Jerry Lee Lewis was blackballed in 1958. He was gone. Chuck Berry was in jail a couple of times. Again, he was out of the scene by 1959. Little Richard found God, became a, a preacher and gave up rock and roll. He was gone by 1959. And in 1959, Buddy Holly was killed in a plane crash. So with the kingpins of rock and roll gone by 1960, rock and roll was virtually dead. Uh, it was taken over by, well, the pop music scene with bo all the Bobbies, Bobby Vinton, Bobby V, Bobby Curtola, Connie Francis, Annette Funicello, very safe middle of the road and parents couldn't be happier because this devil music was gone. Their kids went back to a more straight kind of uh, predictable life in their mind anyway. Until 1964 when these guys arrived, the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan Show, February 9th, 1964, and that was the big bang for rock and roll. Uh, it was a record setting amount of, uh, I wish I had the stats, I think it was 70 million people tuned in, which was the biggest TV audience ever per capita. And here in Ottawa, I was sitting in front of the TV when the Beatles came on. So it was my sister and brother and my parents tolerated it. Uh, they played some rock and roll songs. They also played a, a show, a, 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 uh, I think it was a, a show from a, a stage show called Till There Was You or something, a very sappy uh, song for the adults. So the adults thought, well, maybe they're not so bad after all. But during this show, we have stories in the book about young kids going on the phone, talking to their friends saying, can, you, can you believe what's going on the Ed Sullivan show now? We got to start a band. And it wasn't mainly the music. It was a reaction. It was the girls out there screaming. And to any 14, 13 year old boy, you're in. I mean, if you want to get the girls, you got to be in a rock and roll band. And guitar sales shot up literally the next day. It was amazing. When Beatlemania hit Ottawa, we had the authentic Beatle wigs sold out in stores all over the place. Everybody had their Beatle lunch boxes. And the number of bands that started up in the next six months was incredible. Most of them really bad. But some of the established groups like the Esquires and Staccatos, started changing their repertoire and doing more Beatles and British influenced music. But for the kids, it was all about the Beatles. Uh, if you were a, a girl, a young girl in school at the time, 
Uh, and Lynn, I know you probably were at the time, or maybe not, not born yet, I should say that. If you had a locker at school, chances are you had some pinups in there. You had, had to have, of course, Paul McCartney. He was a cute one. You had to have so dreamy. Michael, Michael Landon from Bonanza. He was another big pinup at the time. You probably had Richard Chamberlain from Dr. Kildare. You know, none of the guys would go by and look in the lockers and go, come on, really? Heartthrobs? We had things like, you know, the Rolling Stones, the boy bands. We had the Who. We had, oh, how'd that get in there? Okay, Julie Newmar from the, from the, from the Batman show. She had, it was kind of a must for most people. Uh, but it was all about the Beatles, and it was all about, you know, the Beatle mania happening. Uh, we had two Beatles come to town in the 60s. John Lennon came in 1969. Uh, to address a, uh, a talk on world peace at Ottawa U, which was co-organized by Alan Rock, future um, Minister of Health and, and others under the Liberal government. In fact, Alan Rock drove them around town later and did tell me that there was a particular odd odor coming out of the back seat where John and Yoko were, were, were sitting with the windows down. Uh, they went to visit Prime Minister Trudeau, literally drove up to the house, but he wasn't home. Uh, so Lennon did come back later in 69 to meet with uh, with Trudeau, he found it to be a very, very cool guy. Uh, George, Lennon, George, George Harrison came to Ottawa to Louis Boo Coffee House in 1969 to check out a, a singer named Eric Anderson. And that apocryphal story is in here as well. Uh, it was all about the Beatles and Ottawa had a great Beatle connection thanks to the albums. A few people know that the, the most of the records, the Beatle records in Canada and in the States were pressed in Smith Falls at the RCA uh, pressing plant. Now it was, a, they were on the Capitol label, but they had a deal with RCA. So 90% of the Beatles albums were pressed right here in this area. A nice bit of history and apparently lots were smuggled south at night, uh, clandestinely by the, uh, by the employees there. Uh, but if you wanted to reel the best Beatle albums sound wise, audio files said, you gotta get the Canadian versions. And they were all pressed right here in the Smith Falls area. By 1966, 1967, television had really, really soaked up Beatlemania and the whole music phenomenon. We had shows like Hullabaloo and Shindig with the dancing girls and the live bands playing. We had shows here in Canada like Let's Go and uh, Where It's At and What's Happening. All these amazing shows. We had our own dance show here in Ottawa called Saturday Date, which was not really up to American bandstand uh, credentials or uh, values, but it was once a week and it would show Ottawa kids in a big hall at CGOH dancing to the latest hits. And uh, everyone had to watch it. You had to find out what the latest songs were. And of course, later on, 1966, uh, there was an ad in Variety magazine looking for some youngsters to play in a TV show, to play musicians in a, in a music show. And uh, legend has it, Charlie Manson tried out for this, didn't make it. Steve Stills tried out for it. But finally, we had Davy Jones, who was a veteran at the time, Mike Nesmith, Peter Tork, and on drums, of course, the one, the only, Mickey Dolans. And in 1967, we had uh, the Prefab Four, as they were called, on television. Now, there's a nice hook here to, to the visual because this picture is a still from a, the first Canadian rock video ever made. And it was made by the Esquires. The guy on the left, Gary Como, was from that earlier band we saw. The fellow on the cover of, of the book, Rockin' on the Rito, is on drums, Richard Patterson, nicknamed the Round Mound of Sound, who was the flag bearer for the auto music scene years, I think it was about eight years ago. And they had one of the first rock videos here in Canada. Other great Ottawa bands, we had Don Norman and the other four. Uh, Don Norman had been the original lead vocalist for the Esquires. They were more a garage, punky kind of sound. And their stuff is really worth checking out. It's on YouTube. And if you heard the All in a Day interview I did today with Alan Niels, they played Don Norman on, on the way out. Uh, we had a band called The Fifth Dimension who had to change their name uh, in 1966 because of an American band called The Fifth Dimension who many hits with Up, Up and Away and, and others. And they became The 5D. One of many, many amazing Ottawa bands who produced great singles that got fantastic play on the radio. We'll talk about that in just a second. But again, they weren't really heard outside of Ottawa, so they kind of disappeared, but now we're resurrecting them. We had the Townsman, same kind of thing. Fantastic vocals, 
Again, Ottawa was very much a vocal city. Uh, they, and they still work through the 1980s with the Cooper brothers and Octavian, bands that were not renowned for their vocals. And uh, a lot of this comes from the British, uh, you know, the British influence on the Staccatos were fantastic singers. And they put out some great music as well. Here are the Staccatos in 1967 recording what I think is the greatest Ottawa single of the 1960s called Half Past Midnight. It was done in Montreal. They had strings on it, the first Ottawa band to have strings. And the Staccatos were a band that should have gone great places. And in fact, they would, as we'll hear in a second. But they did manage to play Toronto occasionally, down east as well. And in Montreal, uh, they won RPM Awards, which was the uh, precursor to the, uh, uh, the Juno Awards uh, in the 1960s, so did the Esquires. But these guys were so good, they could match anything coming out of the United States or Britain, but they just didn't get the airplay outside of Ottawa because there wasn't an established radio linkage scene here in Ottawa or even concert tour scene. Uh, we had some very bad fashion choices in the book. Uh, most of the bands got their, uh, their, I think it was Chuck Delfino downtown, they, they got their outfits. And this band called the Indies never went anywhere, but fashion-wise, they rocked it. Look at those matching uh, double-breasted suits. And this band called, uh, oh, I, I don't know their name with them, but they, they were all dressed in Ottawa, or, sorry, Canadian uh Army outfits, I, they must have been taken from the, the Kingston, Kingston uh, uh, because one of them, I think it was a cadet there, and they all dressed up like, you know, Canadian soldiers of the 1800s. Don't ask me why. We had bands like Canada Goose who evolved out of the earlier scene. Uh, once again, Richard Patterson in the front there with the goatee, the drummer and organizer, and uh, they had international success. They even played for President Richard Nixon down in the States for some reason. They were invited to and had to undergo thorough identity checks before they were allowed to, to play for Tricky Dick, but he did love them apparently. And f further on into the decade, bands got a bit hipper. They uh, kind of dropped the suits and ties and went for something a bit more, you know, apropos for the late 19, 1960s. Uh, here we have Bruce Colburn on the front with a band he was in called The Children. Out front we have uh, Peter Hodgson, better known as Sneezy Waters. It's kind of like an all-star band. Uh, coming out of Ottawa, but unfortunately they didn't go very far at all. Uh, but they should thank this man, and we should all thank this guy for what went down in the 1960s, the concerts, uh, the radio, every facet of the Ottawa entertainment scene had some input from Harvey Glatt, who thankfully is still with us. He started a chain of record stores in 1956 here in Ottawa called Treble Clef that became a thriving chain by the 1980s. It was the first standalone music store in Ottawa. And right from the get-go, he supported local artists. He brought uh, people like, for example, Pete, Pete Seeger was the first band he brought to town. But later with his bass clef productions, that's when we got Led Zeppelin, we got David Bowie, we got Genesis, all the big stars of the 1970s. He was also involved in bringing the Rolling Stones to town in the 1960s. And uh, he, was, he was one of the founding uh, fathers of Lucky Boo Coffee House, which was most of the musicians I talked to from the 60s would go there on a regular basis. They would call it their school, their music school. They would see blues artists, jazz artists, folk artists, some rock artists. And that's really what gave Ottawa such a unique sound. He also was a patron for many bands like the children and others who he would just support financially, help them you know, get the right contacts and get the right equipment to, uh, to, to make a go of it in this business. And uh, without him, we would have you know, it would have paled in comparison to what actually actually happened. It was amazing the work that Harvey Glad did. Then in the 1970s, as we look, we see in book number two, he, he took his spare time and put together a radio station that was called uh, Shea 106, and that became a huge hit. And in the early years, especially a supporter of local music, not so much later on when it was sold and became more of a, you know, a, a American format kind of thing. But in the early years, Harvey really made sure that it was, uh, it was a supporter of local talent and hired almost all local people to, uh, to get the station off the ground. So Harvey Glatt was one of those people. And, and speaking of radio, I often get asked, why was the 60s such, such a successful decade for bands? Like, how did they rise above the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, the Beach Boys, all this competition? It was because of the media. 
it was because Ottawa radio stations played Ottawa bands. Ottawa bands would pop up on a regular basis in the top 20 songs in Ottawa in what we call the swing set, the, the, uh, the weekly chart that came out, uh, put together by a guy named Doug McKean. There would be three or four Ottawa bands in the top 20. It was not unusual to have an Ottawa band at number one, beating up the Beatles and the Stones. And when kids hear the, heard the music on the radio, this gave the bands really more relevance. And they became stars on an equal level with the other you know, major superstars kids were hearing. So you'd hear them on the radio, you'd read about them in the paper, thanks to a, a journalist named Sandy Gardner, who came over from Scotland in the 1960s. And he talked the Ottawa Journal into giving them a page every week in, in the Ottawa Journal on a Saturday to really in, investigate and, and talk about youth culture and Ottawa bands. Uh, there was a list of where all these bands were playing. You know, they say, okay, the Staccatos, they've got a new album coming out and here's the story behind it. So again, all these bands were treated just like their contemporaries out of the States and out of Britain. Kids would hear about it, they'd go to the shows, shows would be pandemonium, they'd sell out. These local bands were opening for the Rolling Stones and the Beach Boys. Every major band that came to town had at least one Ottawa band opening for them. Uh, there were two opening for the Animals when they came to town in March of 1967, where there was Ottawa's only rock and roll riot. And I'll tell that story quickly here before we get to perhaps some questions. Uh, the Animals were one of the major bands of the British invasion. In 1967, uh, they were kind of falling apart. They were going through changes. The music was changing and they were changing. They came to Ottawa to play the, uh, the Coliseum building down at Lansdowne Park, which was a regular spot for bands to play. Uh, there were two Ottawa bands opening for them, the Eyes of Dawn and the 5D, I believe. And they went through and they did their show and it was great. The show was sold out. And then there was a lull. Um, not, nothing happened. The lights sort of dimmed, which was for the usual. Usually there's a, a changeover on the stage as you change one band to another. But a half hour went by and then an hour went by. And the man who was MC in the show, who we, we meet in the book, Al Pussycat Pascal, was MC in the show. He had one of those great rock and roll nicknames. And um, came from a, a dippity doo commercial or something that said, oh, Al, you're a pussycat. And he took that as this nom de radio. But he went backstage to see what was happening. And the lead singer, Eric Byrne, was sitting on, on one of the hockey benches back there. And he said, we're not going on. Until I get paid, we're not effing going on. And Al said, well, you know, there's uh, 2,000 kids out there who want you and are starting to chant. I'm not going on unless we get paid. So apparently the promoter didn't have enough money to pay the extra fee that the animals were looking for. It's kind of a gray area as to what happened. Probably the promoter's fault. And sure enough, after an hour and a half, the band packed up and left. So we're faced with an empty stage with the lights on kind of dim out front. The sound guy who we talked to here, all new equipment up there. It was all new stuff. And he said, the band's not coming out. We better get the stuff off the stage quickly. So he organized his, his, his crew and said, okay, you take this, you take that, you take that, get it as fast as you can, get out to the truck, put it in, and let's get the hell out of here. Something bad's going to happen. By now, the crowd was saying, we want our money back. And so on, on Doug McKean's cue, everyone ran out the stage, got the stuff, ran to the truck, and all hell broke loose. The, the fans invaded the stage, they ripped the stage apart, they tore down the hockey boards, and there was even a fire lit outside, and maybe one in the bathroom, that's, that's debatable. The police were called, and it was just a full-fledged riot. For the first and only time, I believe, in Ottawa history, the Ottawa Chief of Police got up on stage and read the Riot Act, which is basically, get out of here or there's going to be big trouble, we're going to start arresting people. 75 kids were detained. Most were let go. Uh, I think about maybe 20, the numbers in the book, were charged with disorderly conduct and received light sentences. And uh, two days later, uh, a group of remorseful kids marched down to City Hall. Mayor Fogarty was on the steps and greeted them. And they apologized for the outrageous behavior at the animal show. That wouldn't happen today, but this was the 60s. And uh, as for the show itself, there was over $7,000 in damages to the Coliseum. There wasn't another show at the Coliseum for many, many years and very few afterwards. And uh, the, the newspapers, of course, 
had a field day with this. The headline in the journal the next day was, kids run amuck or run amuck in Ottawa, rock fans riot. And there were some pictures and it all looked like, yeah, parents were going, yeah, this is what we worried about. It was all this devil's music, rock and roll. But it was one of those things and uh, it was the devil's music, I guess, at that, at that particular stage. But that's one of the great stories in the book. And one, again, that I think not many people know about unless you were there or alive at the time. And the way the radio station supported uh, their the local bands was just off the off the off the dial. It hasn't happened since in the 1970s and 80s. Local music was phased out to where today you only hear it really on CKCU Carlton and also CBC. Alan Neal does a great job of playing and supporting local talent. And there are other statistics in here. At at one point, there were 75 working bands in Ottawa in 19. 67, I believe. And by working, I don't mean having a gig a, a gig every month in someone's basement. These bands were working three, four nights a week at one of over a hundred venues. And these venues were not all clubs, although we had big clubs like Pineland, Lakeside Gardens, over on the Hull side later on, of course, the Shod, the Ottawa House. We go more into the Shod in book number two and legendary Jerry Barb with a great bouncer over there and some great stories from there. Uh, but every high school had at least one dance a week, church basements. They kicked out the bingo players and started booking bands. They got up to a thousand kids to see one Ottawa band in a church basement. It was unbelievable. And uh, there were say, other restaurants would bring in bands after hours. We had bands playing at movie theaters between shows. If they were showing rock and roll movies, they'd put a live band on between because most of the theaters had stages back then. We had uh, one, uh, a fellow whose name is Casey now, he was more a rockabilly artist. He would play on the roof of the drive-in concession at the, at the, uh, at one of the drive-ins, probably the Britannia or something, between movies. He'd just get up there with his little lamp and play up on the, up on the roof of this, where you go to get your popcorn. Bands would play wherever they possibly could for free or for money. Uh, the big bands were making at least 500 bucks a month which even today is outrageous. Ottawa bands, if they get a hundred bucks a person, you're happy. But back then, $500 was a lot more and they were playing four or five times a week. Uh, the Staccatos, Ottawa's number one band, were getting $1,500 a night to play locally. And this is when they were having you know, local hits primarily. Now, I'll do the, the Staccato story really quickly uh, because that, that was an amazing way to end the book and to end the decade for Ottawa music. Um, they did an album called A Wild Pair, which was a product put out by Coca-Cola who wanted Canada's two top bands to do an album, one band on one side, one band on the other. And determining who Ottawa, or Canada's top bands were was kind of tough, but they chose the Guess Who from Winnipeg who hosted their own weekly TV show that went nationally called Let's Go from Winnipeg. And for their second band, they chose the Staccatos from Ottawa. And this album sold at least 30,000 copies. Capitol Records got wind of this and they took the Staccatos, I guess who already had a label, but they took the Staccatos down to Los Angeles to record down there for the big time. And they decided the Staccatos, the name was a little bit old. So they came upon a new name after a song they'd written called the Five Band Electrical Band. And for the next few years, they recorded, didn't have much action. In 1970, they recorded a song called Signs, and it was a bomb. Didn't do anything. Uh, so the record company said, well, that's a good song. Let's give it to someone else. They gave it to a 60s boy crooner named Bobby V, who had many hits. He was like a pinup. Boy, the sweater and the big hair and the whole thing. He was trying to make a bit of a comeback. And so they gave it to Bobby V. It was, you know, a timely song. It was kind of hip for the for 1970. It was about rebellion and, you know, fighting against the, the establishment. And he had a moderate hit with it in the Southern States. The five band electrical band decided to try it again. And, uh, and this time it went through the roof, became the number one song in North America in the summer of 1972. And book number one, Rockin' on the Rito ends with that song being released. It's volume two, the 70s starts with a reaction to the song. So it's a nice kind of flow going there. And Les Emerson talks about their adventures as a, as a number one band in North America. 
didn't last long. They came back to Ottawa, and that was it. Les Emerson continued. But it, it's an amazing story. It shows the talent that was here, and if only, if only it had, these bands had gotten American uh, coverage back in the early days, we could have had more five-man electrical bands because the other groups were just as good. The songs are still out there, thankfully. And the object of this book was to get it out while all these people are still alive. And I know I'm running out of time here, but uh, one more story to share. I'm one of the members of the High Tones I interviewed, he's in his 80s now, lives out in the Maritimes. And when we were finished and he saw the book, he, he called me and said, I just want to thank you for putting out this book because now my grandkids know that grandpa was a star because his picture's in the book. And another fellow I delivered the book to, he, he started to well up a bit when I gave it to him because he said a friend of mine who was in a band in the 60s with me just passed away. I wish he'd seen this. And his picture's in the book and I just want to thank you for it. And there are tons of stories like that. And the book is in the, in the Ottawa Public Library. I believe there are 25 copies, which is which I'm so pleased with. Uh, but if you they're all out and the holds, I think there are about 80 holds on them. So you might get it by Christmas. But again, it's it's there forever for anyone who wants to research it or just go back and, you know, writing a book during COVID, I hadn't planned that. But it's a nice time to step back to days that were, you know, better in a lot of ways. You know, and we were kids, we were going to see that we were listening. I was listening to the radio with my rocket radio under the covers late at night, listening to Al Pascal and, and, and these guys, uh, Nelson Davis and, and so many other great disc jockeys, listening to the music, living the music and, and experiencing it. And hopefully that's what it is. It's a step back, but also for musicians today, it's a, it's a glance back at how things were and things will never be like that again, unfortunately. Um, so again, I thank you for your time and thank you for tuning in. Hope you enjoyed the step back and it brought back some memories. And, uh, you know, any questions you have, just flip them over to Richard and I'll do my best to, uh, to answer them. Yeah, thanks, Jim. I've got a couple questions here for any couple comments, but I also want to let you know about, about five minutes ago, I put out a challenge to anyone uh, to see if they can stump me with some rock trivia. Mm. So far, no response, though. Maybe everyone's... Oh, good. <laughs> so we'll see if someone's got something. In the I got meantime, the... one comment here, David Dunlop, I wanted to mention his... I think he was referring to the Elvis concert. We said, I was there. I won tickets in the Ottawa Journal coloring contest. Oh my God. <laughs> That's amazing. I'm sure you didn't hear a thing either because they were screaming and looking back at the pictures of the equipment and the amps these guys were using, they were tiny. And I believe Gord Atkinson told me he couldn't get through his intro because the girls started screaming too much. There were two shows. It was probably the same at both, but also CFRA had their, uh, their first studios in the in the Coliseum building. So they had a ringside seat. Oh, that's a great memory. Yeah, there's one just came in now. Which hotel did Elvis stay at? You know? He stayed at the uh, Beacon Arms on, is it Slater? Uh, the Beacon Arms had just opened that year in 1957. And it was, well, it was billed as a world-class hotel. I had a postcard of it in the book, but I, I, for space reasons, I had to take it out. And again, from what we hear, uh, the pink Cadillac was parked in the parking garage underneath. <laughs> I don't know if it was ever seen on the streets of Ottawa, but no, he stayed. Uh, he stayed at the at the Beacon Arms Hotel. I think Hendrix might have stayed there as well. I mean, you talk about the artists who came to town: Jimi Hendrix, the Cream, and the Who all played the Capitol Theater. <laughs> I was at the Cream show, and it was just unbelievable. Well, I saw Wilson Pickett there as well, but we had the Rolling Stones, the Beach Boys, Dylan, Simon and Garfunkel, Johnny Cash, and. The, the band, I mean, Ottawa was not a backwater anymore. It was being established as a must stop for bands between Toronto and Montreal. They used to just skip over Ottawa. But, you know, thanks in, in large part to Harvey Glatt and the explosion of bands, it became Toronto, Ottawa, Montreal, or Montreal, Ottawa, Toronto. So Ottawa became, it wasn't a backwater anymore in the 1960s and 70s. It was, geez, just a, Zeppelin playing here in 1970. Mm -hmm. Incredible. Yeah, speaking of Toronto, I remember as a kid, I used to go to Maple Leaf Gardens. Mm -hmm. But the one thing about the gardens is that the sound was just terrible. Oh, yeah. There. So I, what was the sound at the auditorium like? Uh, I know the Capitol Theatre was very good. But again, you know, sound systems were, were quite primitive back then. Uh, I would guess it was awful, just simply because there were big rooms, they called the Coliseum and the auditorium. And you just didn't have the sound to fill it. So unless you were out front, probably... Not so good. Even the Civic Center, when it opened in 1967, it was a concrete bunker. That's what it was. It was made for hockey. And 
you know, even the best bands in the 70s didn't sound their best there, but it, it got a bit better. And the Chorale Center, of course, took that up a notch. But sound was not the prime reason for going to shows back then. It was, it was to be out. This is, of course, it's before. The experience. Oh, yeah. And again, people, when they, people ask me, well, what happened to the Ottawa music scene in the 80s? And it declined, obviously. And one main reason was that in the 60s, pardon me, if you wanted to see live rock and roll, you had to go out to see it. It wasn't coming to you on TV very much. Uh, the radio you could listen to, but there was no internet, there was no MTV, etc. And you and your friends would talk about music, and you'd sit down, you'd decide where to go that night. And you'd jump on the bus, or the parents would drop you off somewhere, and you'd go to see a band. It, and most of the time it was a local band, but it was about the scene, it was about you know, the screaming, about hearing them on the radio, then going to see them, and oh, he's so cute, that guy. And, uh, you know, it was just part of the scene. There wasn't much else to do on a Friday or Saturday night in Ottawa. So you went out, you saw a band, and then you were home by 11. Uh, someone here, Brenda Hunter, just uh, comes. Do you remember anything about the Beach Boys? She says the Beach Boys played Ottawa four times. Do you remember oh, that? Well, I know they played the auditorium at least once. Uh, but the Beach Boys played Ottawa on a regular basis at the Corral Center. Uh, I remember a show at the at Lansdowne Park probably 1980-ish, they played, and I was sitting in the north side stands, and during the big medley at the end, everyone was up, and you could feel the stand going up and down. And mm -hmm. it was kind of scary, but that's all oh, the Beach Boys were perennials. Like, they, they made their, their, their living touring after the, uh, the hits dried up for them. And they were always fun to see, always great professionals. And someone here, uh, Hugh McGovern, says, in the late 60s, do you, do you remember a band called Samsara? I, I played for Samsara for about a week. Um, when they were oh. <laughs> between drummers, I auditioned for them. But they were, they, yeah, we got a section on Samsara in the second book. They were one of Ottawa's, if not the first jazz rock band in Ottawa, a band with horns. And uh, they were very popular in this area. They toured out west for a while. And it was part of a neat trend. We had four or five horn bands. And it was kind of revenge of the nerds to some extent, because if you play in the high school band and you play the trombone, you weren't all that hip. Yeah. But when we started getting bands like Blood, Sweat and Tears and Chicago and the Eyes of March and Lighthouse, a great Canadian band with the horns out front, you know, the brass players became kind of cool. So they started up or joined these bands like Sam Sarah, Tree was another good one, Weight was another, and I'm missing a couple, but they're all in, in volume number two. We have a whole section on the horn bands. And uh, I was, my first band was a horn band in 1967. It was called the Brass Bull. We played all Herb Albert and the Tijuana brass music and wore ponchos. <laughs> Rito High School. <laughs> Yeah, he mentions here with the band Sam Sarah, the keyboard player went on to play with Oscar Peterson, and he was asking, do you remember his name? Is it Lance Anderson? Do you recognize that name? That rings a bell, and if I had my second copy in front of me, I could tell you, uh, but I don't, unfortunately. Um, I know their second keyboard was a guy named Neil Bateman, but the, yeah, the first the, the, a couple of these guys went on to huge success with people like Bruce Colburn and... Uh, one guy I know played with Ella Fitzgerald. It might have been that keyboard player. And uh, yeah, these, so, we this is great all in musicians. volume two, right? It's so all in volume two. Coming out. <laughs> Tune into volume two when it comes out, probably late October, early November. Mm -hmm. uh, and we talk a lot about the arrival of FM radio as well, the birth of Shay and CKCU and how that impacted on the Ottawa uh, AM radio scene. We talked about the great clubs and, of course, the bands like Octavian, the Cooper Brothers, Sam Sarah, and... Uh, as many others as, as I could find. Yeah, there's someone else who looks forward to your second book here because he's saying, are you going to cover the many bands, the many, many bands who played the Civic Center? So that looks like yeah. that's going to have to be involved. I've got, I, I've hooked in with some really good photographers and we've got uh, live shots of Genesis and Queen from the Civic Center. We've got uh, shots from, uh, we got the Tragically Hip at Barrymore's. We have David Wilcox at the Black Swan. And mm -hmm. we've got uh, a band called... Uh, the Vibrators, who were the first British punk band to tour North America, and their second show was at the Carlton University pub. And we have a picture of that. And believe it or not, the first Rush show in Ottawa Ooh. was at the Carlton University pub in 1973. Oh. So, so, my question, oh, sorry, go, go ahead. 
No, they, we have a lot of trivia. I love trivia myself. And yeah, I was going to a couple more trivia here because here's some of Nancy Peters. I'm going to word it as a trivia question. Sure. Because uh, we talked about it when we met on, on Monday about a, a commercial student that attended Fisher Park High School in Ottawa. Remember someone we were talking about? Were well, Paul Anka. Paul, Paul Anka. Anka. Yeah. He went to Fisher and the kids hated him. Really? Um, there's a story from this Huey Scott, who I mentioned earlier, the rockabilly guy uh, from Raceville. When he moved to Ottawa, he went to Fisher Park. And he told me, uh, Paul Inc. always wanted, he did all the talent shows, of course, because that was his thing, more power to him. But he always wanted to sing with bands. And he wanted all these people to back him up. And the word around the school was that if you backed up Paul Anka, you were dead. <laughs> mm -hmm. You were the biggest nerd. But he was not the most popular kid because mm -hmm. he was pushy. But obviously a great talent. And, you know, very proud of what he achieved here in Ottawa. But all these bands that we try to go, to go into the high schools they attended as well, because Sam Sarah, I think it was, oh, there are the five or six, it started at one of the high schools that escapes me right now, but uh, they were all high school bands. Bruce Coburn went to Glebe. And, uh, you know, th th we try to get the backstories as much as possible that people can relate to and, uh, you know, and, and a lot of uh, touchstones that, oh, I remember that. I remember that disc jockey. Oh, Pussycat Pasco. I loved him. I loved the final hour on CFRA, hosted by Al Pasco and Brian Murphy uh, back in 1968, 69, when they played all the, the cool stuff at 10 o'clock when the, the kids had gone to bed. They played the Doors and all these little Inagata De Vida and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So it was a really exciting time to be into music. And uh, I was lucky to be there on a couple of fronts, I suppose. And then more so in the 70s when I started getting into radio. I don't want to keep it too much longer here, but I'll, people are starting to reminisce now on chat. So uh -oh, the best uh, Les Emerson. Yeah. Recognize that name. Of course, Les Emerson was uh, uh, the leader of the Five Man Electrical Band. And he was, you know, the, uh, he and Vern Craig were the two uh, key members of the uh, Staccatos. In fact, Vern Craig recruited uh, Les Emerson from the aforementioned Huey Scott. They were playing at the uh, Shaw Air Club and, uh, and Vern Craig, this was after the Beatles, when Les Everson saw the Beatles, he saw them at the Shaw Air, they took a break when they were on Ed Sullivan. He, at that moment, he decided, I want to be in a band that writes its own music and, and doesn't do all covers. And Vern Craig offered him that option uh, to join the Staccato shortly thereafter, he jumped at it. And then he and uh, Vern Craig and Les Emerson were a songwriting team like Lennon and McCartney. They wanted the same kind of uh, appearance on the records. And they co-wrote some amazing, amazing music. And Les has been described by very knowledgeable people as Ottawa's Paul McCartney. I mean, he was that good, that talented. Wow. And he's still, he's still out there. He loved the first book. And I was so pleased to have him uh, endorse the second one as well. So Ottawa's Paul McCartney. Mm. Someone mentioned uh, a, another riot that took place at the Civic Center in 1974. Do you remember that, that? I don't know if that was a riot. Oh, wait a minute. Yes, that oh. was that was a mini riot. That was a David Bowie show. Okay, someone tried to stump you, but you got it. It's, okay, it's a David, David Bowie. Concert. I think it was the Diamond Dogs tour, yeah. where <laughs> nothing was going right, uh, and he didn't do an encore for some unknown reason. And I have seen pictures of it uh, with the police lining the stage and people throwing chairs. It was also, when I do trivia, I go all out. Uh, yeah. It was also the last Ottawa Civic Center show with chairs on, on the floor. Um, they went to just, I think, general admission because people were throwing the chairs on the stage and they said, chairs, rock and roll, not a good, not a good to mix. <laughs> so they took the chairs out and uh, then we went to general admission which it means first come, first serve, but you have to stand up. And uh, that was a bad idea too, because uh, I think it was a Genesis show in the early 1980s that there was such a rush. There, there's, there were so many people in the mezzanine of the Civic Center that windows were being pushed out and yeah, the kids were really in trouble. This is before the Cincinnati uh, tragedy yeah. with the Hoover kids were killed. And after that, they said, okay, no more general admission. It's going to be all reserved seating from here on in. And uh, that's what they went to. And that's the way it is now at the Corral Center, of course. You know, the GA was kind of fun if you got there early, but it was not safe. It was not safe. Well, I'm impressed with the attorney because someone thought they'd stump you on that. Although they did say close. apparently Bowie got stuck in his spaceship capsule. It wouldn't uh, open up or something. It was more a 
was more a giant hand, which is how the show would start with. <laughs> this hydraulic hand kind of, it can't be any stuck. It got stuck in Montreal, got stuck here in Ottawa, and it was kind of embarrassing, but it covered for it pretty well. But yeah. I, don't, I don't think Bowie was in a good mood by the time he got there. But that was a really amazing tour, the Diamond Dogs tour. And we've got, I think that story is also in the book. Yeah, so I, was say, I don't want to ask you too many questions. We got to save some surprises for your second volume and for your first volume. <laughs> so thanks oh, so much, Jim, for uh, oh. uh, yeah, a, a really a true a walk down memory lane for so many people that remember some great music. Well, uh, was the only thing I, I wanted to comment on just before we close up there, I noticed that when you talk about the riot at the Coliseum, you seem to have some pretty close details on what you weren't an eyewitness, were you? You weren't there for the riot, were you? <laughs> I was not, but I talked to okay. the guy who had seen it, and I talked to the sound guy as well. He he and his crew sat up in the uh, the top of the arena just watched it happen. Okay. I was curious cool. as to where you got your information. It seemed pretty detailed. So well, from the <laughs> horse's <laughs> from the horse's mouth. I mean, and these guys love to talk. Everyone, when you start to talk to some of the older guys, they'd say, "Well, I don't know how much I remember," and then they start. It's just vroom they know everything they remember everything because this was a major part of their lives and it's indelibly stamped as it is with i think a lot of readers who may have forgotten some of the the, the items in here but they'll remember a lot of this some of them going to the shows seeing the bands listening to the radio and just going back to a time that was i guess their forward of years and uh, we can say you know the, the greatest era in music sort of relates to how old you were but as you said earlier the a lot of kids these days are getting into the 60s, into the 70s, because it was that good work when yeah. it comes to music and Absolutely. that exciting and unforgettable. Well, th uh, thanks, Jim, for a great talk. And so volume one is out now. It's out now. Uh, and volume uh, two, last question, volume two. Uh, what, any idea on a release date for volume two? Well, I'm, I mean, just at the uh, some of the picture stage, uh, but I'm expecting the whole thing to be finished by the end of September. Then I had to stand in line for a release because it's a busy time for books. So I'm looking at late October, early November, and uh, it'll be in stores. It's, it's sold, the first volume is sold out now, I think pretty well around town, but I've got another bunch coming in before Christmas. And it's a great Christmas gift, you know, for parents, grandparents, kids, whatever. And uh, I'm not doing this for the money, but it's just to preserve the heritage of this and to preserve the memories and the music and. That's why I'm glad it's in libraries, but it'll be out there and, you know, it's, uh, I hope you yeah, enjoy I it. Just, I called the chapters at, uh, at Rideau and Sussex just to see if they had it and they said they were sold out. So, uh, but you, uh, it is online on Amazon.ca. Amazon.ca. And if you don't like Amazon, uh, Friesen, F-R-I-E-S-E-N Press, which was a publisher, uh, .com, I believe. And, uh, they, they, they do a great job as well. They'll get it to you. And it's local. Yeah. So yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's Canadian. Yeah, it's out of Winnipeg. Yeah. yeah. And so Thanks you don't so like much, Jim. Answer. What a great talk. And uh, I so enjoyed it. And we are going to have you back. I'm going to suggest oh. again that we definitely get you back. Uh, Lynn's going to send you the comments later. A lot of great comments about how much they enjoyed your talk. Well, I hope so, you enjoyed it. And again, I was kind of surprised to be in this forum, but uh, it is it is part of our cultural history. And I hope people enjoyed it and uh, learned something. Did. And so thanks, Jim. Thanks again. So, uh, yeah, I just want to close up by saying uh, we will be back in two more weeks' time uh, with uh, Dave Alston, a familiar name. A lot of people know him. Again, he'll be talking about Tunney's Pasture, the story behind Ottawa's Field of Dreams. And that's two Wednesdays from tonight, Wednesday, September 29th at 7 p.m. So I hope to see everyone there. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, everyone, for joining in tonight. And we'll see you in two weeks' time. Thank you. Thank you.